Um, uh, th thank you very much for um, uh, the invitation uh, to uh, to present. When when um, we saw the title, I thought I would put my uh, bulletproof jacket on. Um, uh, so uh, the title is "What is the reality in aortic care uh, in uh, London, and uh, where should we send the patients?" And um, I think you should send the patients in a place that they do aortas, and uh, in a place that they think about aortas. Um, doing aortas um, uh, has to uh, take into consideration uh, the number of cases that you do uh, in terms of the center, uh, the surgeon volume, and then mortality, and, but more importantly, especially when you're dealing with aortic pathologies, uh, the failure to rescue. Uh, and uh, the, the failure to rescue concept is, is being used actually recently. Um, uh, this is from a, a very hot off the press um, analysis from the STS database. And um, uh, you can see that the correlation between failure to rescue and the number, especially uh, the middle column, shows that uh, in any center that um, you have uh, less than 10 cases per year, um, you can uh, see that the odds ratio um, uh, it's, um, of failure to rescue uh, is, is increasing. Uh, and the failure to rescue is not just now the mortality and who survives an operation, but everything that it is related to the complications that can lead uh, to mortality. Uh, so failure to rescue and, 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 and volume is an important concept to keep in mind. Um, now, you would think that I would be able to say straight away what is the uh, UK activity um, in terms of uh, acute aortic pathologies by means of dissections, uh, as well as uh, an elective complex aortic surgery. Uh, but uh, the answer is probably we don't know. Um, I'm just going to try and navigate on the information that we have. This is, this is from the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery and the Blue Books. Uh, this is the sixth Blue Book, goes quite some time back. It covers a period of for four years. And you can see this is addressing acute aortic dissections. And we know that we do about, on average, 270 uh, cases a year for that period uh, in the UK. So uh, the next one actually addresses elective, um, in terms of volume elective and um, um, uh, acute aortic dissections. And we know that we do about 250 for that period of time. Uh, and the uh, same pattern follows the elective cases as well. Uh, the one uh, um, in 2021 doesn't mention anything about aortic surgery. Uh, the, uh, then the, the paper from the national database follows by Benedetto et al. Uh, from the UK aortic surgery group. And so what we know that in a period of uh, nine years nationally, um, we have uh, performed um, about 4,203 uh, cases, which um, increases up to about 467 operations a year. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, over a period of time the increase in the cases, uh, the increase in the volume results also an increase in mortality nationwide. Uh, and this is give, giving you a flare of the operations that we do, which is a hemi arch as a standard for acute aortic dissections and an interposition graft in the majority of the cases. Um, the most recent one in uh, 2023, uh, I think it summarizes here the, what we have all experienced, and there are lots of factors uh, that they may have led to that, is that there is a significant increase in uh, emergency uh, aortic dissections. Uh, and uh, I think uh, this is the result of primary care and emergency physicians. The patients group have played a significant role in raising awareness here. Uh, and uh, also the formation of specialist cardiac centers with the aorta in mind. Uh, the mortality actually rate has gone down from the 24% to about 17%. So the correlation between volume awareness and the decrease in the mortality because of the increase in specialist centers uh, is there. Uh, you can see that in the uh, bars uh, with the increase on the left-hand side, and there is a definite trend between mortality and um, uh, case volume. Um, the same thing um, with our colleagues at King's, we've been uh, doing a common rota for the past like 12 years. Uh, and when it comes to acute aortic dissections, you can see uh, the, uh, the increase over time. 
uh, here was COVID, and despite COVID, uh, the numbers uh, persisted, and uh, the upward trend is there. Uh, the same thing, the same, the same trend go, uh, goes along with the uh, number of, uh, of elective cases. Um, uh, this is the um, data from our colleagues from Royal Brompton and Harefield, and again, the same uh, trend uh, follows. Uh, this I have borrowed from uh, Professor Wu, uh, and so was the increase in the number of cases over the years in acute aortic dissections. Uh, same thing applies to the elective cases. Uh, so, uh, putting it all together in terms of activity in uh, London, uh, we do about uh, 160 acute aortic dissections a year. Uh, we don't have a feel of how many elected cases we'll do, but this is shortly to be uh, put together, uh, which means that uh, London does about one quarter to one third of um, the acute aortic dissections nationally. Um, we do have a common rota with uh, St. Thomas's and King's, which has been going on since uh, 2012, 24-7. Same thing applies from, for Brompton and Harefield, and as well as the Bath Hut Centre. Uh, recently, Hammersmith have started uh, doing acute aortic dissections, and St. George's has uh, rejoined uh, the South London uh, rota as um, of 1st of September. So, this is the, what's been happening around London. So, in terms of you know, do we have a real aortic centers? Um, aortic centers are still part of what we call cardiac centers. Uh, a lot revolves around uh, the acute aortic dissection toolkit, and uh, I think uh, Professor will talk into more detail about this. Uh, but um, aortic centers, they mainly stem, revolve around, you know, having uh, multidisciplinary aortic teams. Uh, and working all together and getting all the specialists that they're interested in aortic diseases together. Um, so uh, you can see um, the different parts of the aorta, they, can, they are different, uh, but you, we should be able to get all the specialists together uh, in one meeting, in one place, and anytime you really need them uh, for uh, decision making. Um, uh, on, on, on this theme, and our, Although this one revolves around the acute aortic dissection, I think it's, it's, it's inevitably expanding also into the uh, complex aortic surgery. Uh, we have had an initial meeting between um, uh, cardiac and vascular surgeons and interventional radiologists uh, initially in September 2022. Um, the, there was a lot that was uh, discussed, but it's mainly establishing a common pathway and a governance to support uh, the multidisciplinary aortic teams. Uh, so that was followed by a, sec by a second round on the 10th of March, and we have kind of expanded in the people that they were involved, including cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons, radiologists, obstetricians, paramedics, everybody that has to do with acute and uh, elective cases, really, uh, to get together. Uh, so everybody uh, thinks that we should have clear-cut pathways, uh, aortic centers should be um, uh, supported, uh, and everybody should have access uh, to uh, aortic specialists. Um, working groups uh, are uh, evolving, and uh, now we have vas our vascular surgery colleagues are very actively involved, and should we should have data about the type B dissections uh, and thoracoabdominal aorta pathologies. Um, the cardiac surgeons that they do, they provide service in London. Uh, they, we also met, tried to pan out uh, uh, data collection, uh, as well as finalize uh, uh, a common pathway. Um, I will, th this one really shows how um, NHS England is, man is monitoring the key performance indices. Uh, this again revolves around the toolkits, uh, but uh, it will soon expand to the elective uh, work. Uh, so the scene has changed. We have the charitable trust. We have uh, the patients being involved. Uh, we have leaflets, um, emergency physicians are more aware, CT scans are done more commonly. We do see increase in the number of referrals. Uh, the UK Aortic Society plays a significant role to it in um, collaboration, very close collaboration with the Vascular Surgical Society as well as the Cardiothoracic Surgery uh, Society. Uh, so wh what's happening in London um, right now, we have cardiac, cen cardiac centers that they provide excellent care for acute and non-acute aortic uh, pathologies. Work needs to be done, especially around governance and data collection. 
the coordination of movements of patients in the acute setting and continuing support for the multidisciplinary aortic teams. And uh, really we're talking about sending the patients in cardiac centers, but what we need probably is the aortic centers. The aorta is one, so one aorta, one service. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any, any questions or comments? Please, go ahead. Then there's the slider. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. uh, if anyone is shy to ask questions, then there's a slider you can ask. Uh, put your questions there and we can read them out for you. But I'm sure no one is shy here. But I'll just kick off, uh, Michael. Well done. And very good presentation and to start off the meeting. Um, uh, we, we know the answer to this, but if you can let the um, audience know as to what happens when a center in London gets a, a patient referred to them with dissection and they're not able to do that patient. So what's the yeah. communication uh, scheme uh, for that? So uh, right now the, re the referrals for acute aortic dissections are divided between uh, uh, north uh, and south. Uh, so um, we get the referral and then if we're not able to, because we're not able to accept the patient, uh, then we will have to find the next available um, uh, center. Uh, so we'll have to call the consultant, the aortic consultant, and call in the nearest center uh, around London and uh, divert the patient. So this is exactly what's happening. Um, it's very difficult to... Uh, the, uh, there are the odd cases that, you know, a, a lot of places are uh, doing something at the same time with some inevitable delays, but this is really very rare. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that needs to be addressed in terms of manpower, as especially because the number of referrals and the number of cases around London internationally is increasing. Christoph, or, or Christoph. Uh, definitely. I'd just uh, like to mention an analogy that I went through 30 years ago when we established the first MI networks and take patients with PMI, irrespective of the availability of an interventional cardiologist at the moment, irrespective of a bed on ICU, we just uh, were assigned to take a patient who came or was announced with an imminent aortic, uh, imminent uh, myocardial infarction and took care of this particular patient on the spot, without asking questions, and without debating with the referring uh, hospital. I think this is, needs to be the goal for, for aortic networks as well, that acute aortic syndrome needs to be accepted in the sector, in the referring sector, irrespective of the at the moment. We always have time to free up a place to get a surgeon on board, without discussing the issue of the talk by the patient in mind. I think. Yeah, I, I, ideally, you know, we should, we should really be having a, a, a seamless movement, um, maybe real, real time, like Uber type, <laughs> uh, where the availability is so there is no delay and the patients can really be <coughs> where there is no delay because uh, the relevant stuff is not available. Our last question. <coughs> I think it's a comment. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. The plan is that the plan is to have a Section services, three waiters, and at any given time, we will know which centre is performing the audit section at the time, and so the same as the transfer, the divert the patient to appropriate centre. And obviously, all the centre will then take the responsibility to, to then make sure that the release and kind of the capacity to provide that. And it's easier said than done, but, but probably that's what we need to do to push to get it done. Sounds a very good objective. Last question. Uh, it's more of a comment. Um, 
backgrounds from trauma and vascular. And if you look at the setup in London with trauma centres, are automatic centres. And they're going to talk about thousands of patients, while well, they always need to talk about a much better scale. And it comes back to Crystal's point that the major trauma centres have an automatic acceptance, and then they'll deal with the. Well, I think one should be careful not to come to the wrong conclusion. The fact that myocardial heart attack centers, vascular centers have more patients is maybe an advantage. Because the more patients you have, the more you can free up resources on a regular basis. Whereas if you have a very low number of patients, that's the problem with dissections, you have problems to free up resources which maybe 80% of the time are not uh, used. Nevertheless, we have to go on um, uh, with regards to time. Thank you very much, Michael, for the Thank presentation. You. Very, very um, uh, good. Uh, I would like to introduce. <laughs> I would like to introduce Alm U, who leads the um, vascular um, uh, or aortic uh, thoracic aortic vascular service at um, Bath, and he will talk to us about implications from the new aortic dissection toolkit in London. Thank you, Alat, and thank you for, for Christo, the organizer, to, to invite me. Um, it's a slide, it's only there. So these are my disclosure. Like Michael said, aortic dissection incidence is increasing by, by increased kind of diagnostic and the education and awareness. You can see the numbers we've seen it before with uh, um, Michael's presentation. That make it life easier for me, actually, so, so that I uh, don't need to repeat some of the things. But one thing we need to see is that in 10 years or a decade-long practice in UK, if you look at the practice, it's unchanged. In 2008, it was 2.6% uh, of patients undergo aortic arch replacement when you have aortic dissection repair. In 2018, 3.1%. No change. And then how about the, the root replacement? Just slight increase in over 10 years. Interposition graph is a main domain. I think in the 2023 onwards, I think we are now at the era, apart from saving life, also start thinking that what uh, Professor Papa said, individualize, reduce risk reduction for, for future intervention and the prognostic factor to get informed. So, so we need to think beyond that. And we've seen over the last 15 years, the section rotors started London and Liverpool, and the aortic surgery fellowship appointment for aortic surgeon, development of aortic MDTs, aortic clinics, surveillance clinic. But not a lot of things has changed in day-to-day -day practice, especially at midnight. And then so, not surprisingly, when the aortic, NHS England decided to ditch the you remember that complex, uh, the, the service specification for complex EO2VASA centers, services, was stitched after long discussion to development. And then the, at the back of that, then the acute part of that uh, service specification come back in as acute EOD, the section two kit, by collaboration of patient support group, cardiac and vascular area, and the CRG, and then, then put together as a EOD, the section two kit, with seven key principles. And then this is something that uh, we can't actually ignore. Every region should have a regional governance and coordinated regional and multidisciplinary team, coordinated multidisciplinary team meeting, regional rotor, single point of contact patient, and a referral shouldn't be looking around, shopping around to get the treatment. Timely and reliable in base transfer, and a safe transfer of the patient from, from the kind of a &E department to the AORI center and specialist treatment for aortic dissection. It shouldn't be operated by the surgeon that who do one aortic dissection a year or maybe one every two years, which has been happening across the, the country and actually across the, across the world in many, many places. And that if you are a patient, would you like uh, to be operated by a surgeon who hasn't done the aortic dissection for, for 12 months or 18 months? And the regional education program to, to guide the right move forward for improvement outcome. And then you need to have all these uh, pre-planned, written SOP protocol for, for all the things to support that uh, management. And then come with uh, the key performance indicator. It's no-brainer for, for these key performance indicator, as you can see, in hospital mortality with intervention as well as without intervention. 
at the moment, nobody knows what's the percentage of turn down, what's the potential of mortality in the turn down patient, because nobody records them. And then also the one year mortality, because so now they shouldn't just look at the upfront mortality, should look at the, at least a medium term uh, mortality, length of stay, number of referral <laughs> intervention to, to look at performance indicator for, for services who will provide acute AOD dissection care that which you and your family will wish to have. And then also to, to look at the time delay, time from the time of presentation to CT scan, presentation to, to intervention, all the things to come with that. And then come with the national AOD dissection pathway example. And this is based on the same principle, so we don't need to go through that a lot in detail. But it has been uh, demonstrated in London AOD dissection services outcome chain, as well as Liverpool, as you can see from 2007, Till 2020, uh, once the mortality reduced from, from the simple change in service delivery can maintain the outcome for, for many years. You may have a little bit up and down, but you can change it. And then not only just acute and the early mortality, also long-term mortality is different uh, between the, if you're treated with a specialist service. Right, so, so what do we have in London? London's Quite fortunate, five out of 11 high volume aortic centers exist in London region, as you can see the numbers. And 30% of the aortic activity, which is about 739 cases in 2021-22, was done in London. And about 30% of UK aortic dissection volume done in London region as well. So, so we are in the right position to, to be able to lead and then to, to innovate and to make changes. And the largest aortic dissection service provides over, actually over 30%. So we have the kind of centers with over 10% of the, the UK volume kind of providing the activities. As we can see these are the activities. So national activity for dissection is about 640. And therefore national activity for, for elective surgery is around 2,700. And that's the number that we have according to the latest uh, NICO and NASCA. So Michael said the three rotors. And these are three rotors spread it and at the beginning before we started. And then so we just a slight minor variation in between the kind of rotors and vases chain to, to bring the patient straight from the door to the theatre. So I met me to theatre, so night to, to kind of to night to skin time dropped to, to about two hours. And then we have our standards, so which is probably in line with when the London AOD dissections uh, rotors are developed with minimum aortic kind of, uh, volume, dissection volume, aortic surgery volume, which is now backed up by the papers that are published around 2017, 2018, about uh, the volume outcome relationship. And this is Michael showing some of the data, so I'm not going to go through that. We had done extensive uh, discussion with stakeholders, multi-professional steering committee, and PPI consultation with everybody. And then, and then after that, developed this uh, aortic dissection uh, pathway for, for one for London. And we had uh, fortunate to get the support from, from everybody. So this is a final draft, which is probably essentially agreed for four pathways. So if you look at, uh, from the patient referral, patient contact to ANE or the kind of pre-hospital, pre-hospital triage, a right to emergency department, diagnostic imaging, tra image transfer, contact to your center. And then, then after that, once you get they decided to type A, go to the EOD center, go to theater, or the IT depends on patient condition, or non a non-B, go to EOD center, all, the, all these three subsets will go to EOD center as a kind of routine. And then there will be exception for some patient may not be able to go to the EOD center. Then once you get to the center, there should be a at talk MDT to, to deal with appropriateness of these treatments. Then after that, subsequent treatment, imaging, pre-discharge imaging, and then the post-discharge management will be in line with all the international guidelines. So, so that's the kind of the introduction. What we have achieved in the last uh, a few months, and the Hammersmith and the St. George's rejoining too. So all the London Cardi Center are in the dedicated, the section road to providing the service rather than standalone performing the center the EOD the session care, which is improvement. And we had agreement on principle for, for how we can actually 
inter rotor into hospital transfer communication, how to move the patient, and that will then will move forward with. And then next step is the data collection to make sure that appropriate data collection to to look at our key performance indicator to, to monitor. And then we have a kind of other initiator like blood pressure remote monitoring. Important after discharge, patients need to be monitored. So, so by having a remote monitoring, and then with a kind of the blood pressure target and guideline, and we have our specialist, uh, the NERCA, she will then have a virtual ward on the autism health that we, we other centers use for the waiting list management or patient monitoring. So these patients will have a virtual ward where that patient have a two-way communication with the team and the blood pressure monitor and the manage accordingly. And then monitoring is just more than blood pressure, symptoms and everything else to go with it. And that could it change, it may change the protocol in the future if we can accurately and aggressively manage the blood pressure control, and especially we started seeing the acute diabetes. And the more recently now we have this uh, initiative for four projects. So the, this is our senior uh, registrar from the Bart's Emergency uh, Department who won the kind of prize for, for the, the grant from the EOD Dissection Charitable Trust for the after performing the uh, pilot for 10 years and the patient's uh, data in Bart's Health for missing diagnosis in the A&E department. And that would then expand it into the whole of London regions. So she will need your help to support, to, to then tease out the number of patients that we miss in emergency department over the last 10 years, and then the, their behaviors and the, 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 their variation, how we can avoid that in the future, how we can improve the service. Regional Governance Day, Regional Education Days are very important, and then transforming the service is a pathway it is most important. So that we need to start thinking like what Crystal said, acute coronary syndrome pathway, and bypassing some of the unnecessary kind of the, the blockages. So I'd like to thank uh, on behalf of uh, all the patients who had the treatment and survived, and the family members, as well as uh, Pan London team, which all of you, and to, to support this uh, project in moving forward. Thank you. Thank you much, thank you much, Alan, for the excellent overview of the <coughs> London situation. John. Uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, misdiagnosis. There are a lot, <coughs> much mar larger number of centres dealing with acute infarcts than there are dealing with um, dissections. So um, a problem that may hopefully is diminishing, but the discovery uh, when the catheter is put into the aorta <coughs> in what is assumed to be a dis uh, an infarct, and it'll the patient is already up to eyebrows in clopidogrel, and suddenly it's a dissection. Now, the transfer of a patient like that is that getting better? This is when it occurs in a non-aortic centre. It does. It, it does come to, to referral. That definitely referral happened, and we do transfer the patient. Now we have a possibility of using cytosol filters to, to try to filter out the, the antiplatelets and during your treatments. So that might help to, to manage the loading with the antiplatelets. So that's why I think the, the places like London where we have a high volume service, and we have innovation to go with it, change in practices to pr prove that, show that, that we can actually improve the outcome of those borderline or high risk patients. And that would then spread to across the, the rest of the nation and hopefully for, for the rest of the world. <coughs> and uh, the misdiagnosis for Barnes Health was 22 over 10 years. And some of them are actually came to Barnes uh, for acute coronary syndrome, did a coronary angiogram, excluded the coronary disease, sent back to, to District General Hospital, and the following morning had that uh, C, repeat CT scan because of the chest swing. Then, then the section that's diagnosed came back to the bars in the morning, and we did the operation. So that's not uncommon. No. And I'm sure this has happened across the, across the country too. So you yeah. have a question on the... Yeah, uh, um, uh, well done for leading on this. Um, I think we, we, we're probably on the right path where once a patient has been diagnosed and referred to a surgical center. Yeah. But there's still quite a lot of work to be done in actually diagnosing the uh, dissection of the uh, syndrome. Where, where do you think we can target that? And how, do we, how are we making progress on that? It is a, it is a multi uh, proms approach we need to. Start with educating the pre-hospital care, uh, the professional care professional, apart from uh, including general practitioner. 
but some patients go to the acute and community care centers, and then they will then come to, to the a &E departments. So if we educate uh, GPs and the paramedics, so they have a, a, at the patient bedside triaging. Because simple triaging, we all recognize it as a cardiac surgeon or EOD surgeon, but some people may not recognize it. So, so then there's, there's triaging. And as soon as once the triage patient arrive to a &E, they shouldn't have to go through the, another process of triaging waiting for another two hours. They should go straight to the CT scanner. Or they can actually, if it's high probability of uh, the triaging score, go straight to the aortic center, go for the CT scanner, from the scanner to theater for, for operation. I think that's something that we need to, to work towards. Other thing is um, the near patient testing with ultrasound. And then probably with AI guided in the future, probably you'll be recognized with a dedicated window. We can teach this for, for, for our juniors as well as the paramedics. And that might help. And then hopefully in the air patient testing biomarkers on the kind of the blood and finger prick test, and hopefully that will come together with the AI guided decision making to come straight to us the AOD center and then avoid the unnecessary delays. Christoph, you had a question? Yes, I have to say to my own chagrin, the, the, the nice guidelines and acute uh, test day presentation in AME departments require only the patient to show some ST, EKG fluctuation and a presentation with chest pain or back pain to qualify for a trip to the cafe. <laughs> Assuming it's an acute coronary. So they don't even have to wait for a troponin or an echo to be done, a handheld to send the patient to the cafe. This is a little bit too lax, I think, and it leads to some of these confusions between acute aortic and acute coronary. So I think it's, it's time to change that from a cardiology point of view to require the troponin test to come back or an echo to be done before we make a decision. Something very simple. If you, if you look back, look from a distance, 34 years you turn up to the hospital with chest pain, and diagnosed as acute coronary syndrome, and go for the coronary Close. and injury mm -hmm. and Close. negative. Or that sometimes give paracetamol and send them home. And I've seen patients coming back to a &E department three times, and they're sent back three times. And finally flew to, to Malta for Christmas holiday. Breathless said that she, uh, Njugan, the, uh, the echocardiogram, shows severe aortic regurgitation and dissection flat. They flew the patient back to, to London for, for aortic dissection repair two weeks later. So, so that's not uncommon. But, but it is something that's predictable, something that we need to be aware of. I think we better move on. Thank, Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. <laughs> so it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Olaf Wendler. Uh, he's going to talk about an interesting problem, the extent of surgical repair in the setting of non-A, non-B aortic dissections. Olaf. Thank you much, uh, John. Thank you much for the organizers of this meeting to invite me. We're just waiting for the slides. Come up. There we go. One more. That's me. You're there now. Good. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a pleasure to talk about non-A, non-B aortic dissections. And, um, uh, and um, it is a term which has um, come up in the uh, uh, recent years. Um, maybe because um, there were a few more of uh, those dissections seen after intervention on the descending aorta with retrograde dissections. But obviously the term has been around for, uh, the, uh, the, the entity has been around for a long uh, time because uh, um, uh, it has never been as easy as only type A and type B dissections. You, only, you know that that in, um, uh, classification was introduced because it was a relatively easy way to determine the direction of uh, travel in terms of treatment for patients. And the main reason was um, that type A dissections, as you know, have a very high mortality, 1 to 2% per um, hour in the first 24 hours. And that was the reason why um, uh, my, my first mentor, Hans Bos, was very clear about this kind of distinction between type A and type B. But nevertheless, at um, uh, 30 years ago, we saw patients with uh, um, uh, dissections which were not classified uh, so easily in these two directions. But the most important point is to identify patients who have a high mortality when they um, turn up with their dissections.
The common definition about non-A, non-B dissections is usually that a dissection um, uh, is uh, a morphology found only in the aortic arch or that the dissection morphology is coming out of a retrograde dissection from um, uh, the left subclavian artery, but usually the ascending aorta is not involved. There's much, not much uh, too much known about the incident prognosis and results of treatment. Um, you have um, noticed in the, um, the first two talks already, there is in general a lot of um, uh, evidence missing around dissections. There's a lot of evidence um, uh, around what is the um, uh, fatality of dissections, what is the incident of myopathy, but all this data is um, uh, um, 30, 40 years old, and, uh, and sometimes one is surprised uh, um, uh, about the lack of data we have uh, from current times. Whenever you have a lack of data, then uh, there are attempts made to have systematic reviews of the few data you have. Uh, this year is one of the bigger reviews on the 14 um, uh, articles from 14 groups with a total of 433 patients. <coughs> Um, we were presented with the non-A, non-B um, dissections. Uh, you can see that um, uh, in the different groups, the um, rate of uh, medical treatment, interventional treatment, was very, very different from 5% medical treatment to 54% medical treatment. The 30-day mortality between medical treatment, 14% and interventional treatment, 3.6% was different. But nevertheless, the problem with all these systematic reviews is always that there is always a selection bias. Uh, there are, uh, are very small um, uh, cohorts of patients involved. And, um, and so, therefore, it's difficult to come to conclusions. We will see a few more data in a moment. But the one, the one thing is very important to recognize, and that is if you have a non-A, non-B dissection, it has a higher mortality than type B dissection. So that means you cannot just go into a direction where you say, okay, all of these patients should have um, uh, um, uh, in the first instance, medical treatment uh, or modified uh, interventional treatment, you need to have a different vigilance with these patients because they face a higher um, uh, mortality risk. When you look at um, the type of treatment, um, you look at the type of treatments uh, performed in these uh, 14 trials, you can see that uh, it ranges from the standard aortic arch um, uh, surgical replacement to, on the right side, uh, just a flap fenestration. Um, there are all kind of different uh, types of treatments in between. And, uh, and um, you can also see that if you look at the, what kind of treatments are most often done, then it is um, TIVA with extra uh, thoracic transposition. Um, it's a TIVA with a chimney graft and hybrid arch repair. It is not clear what the real reason is why these uh, figures are higher in these areas. Maybe it also has something to do with the fact that a lot of these patients are often seen first by the vascular surgeons instead of the cardiac surgeons. But nevertheless, there's a lot of unknown around this. From my personal approach, I would say whenever I have a dissection which is not so easily put into the, the direction of type A or type B, um, then I just try to find out what is the risk of the patient. And the risk of the patient, again, comes down to what is the mortality risk of the patient. And, um, uh, and as we all know, malperfusion is a big problem. Uh, malperfusion, most of the time, uh, is um, easier dealt with endovascular therapy. If the patients are hemodynamically unstable, and if, they, if there is a bleeding source um, beyond the left subclavian, that usually is easier treatable with endovascular therapy. If you have the source on the other side, it's easier treated with surgery, usually. Um, pericardial effusions, which you usually do not see in this patient, but which you can see in this patient if uh, sometimes um, you wait too long. Pericardial effusion, obviously, that is uh, needed to be treated as a normal type A dissection. And if you have a concomitant aortic arch, uh, um, uh, ascending aortic uh, uh, or aortic root uh, aneurysm, you also th should think more progressively in the direction of surgery. Conventional surgery, as you know, for the aortic arch, as it was done in this trial, is usually conventional uh, arch replacement, um, like you see on the right side with an elephant trunk. Um, and, um, but nevertheless, um, that is complex surgery in the context of an aorta, aortic dissection and usually not recommended in conventional type A aortic dissection surgery. So it is very unusual for people to do this surgery, and that's the reason why um, not everyone feels comfortable with that. The frozen elephant trunk, 
was introduced some time ago and um, has some advantages in terms of the um, uh, surgical techni and technique, um, uh, how it is implanted, which makes it a little bit easier for the surgeon. Um, but on the other hand, it also has some other risk, and you can see from this uh, um, uh, early data from 2013, um, the risk of paraplegia is not necessarily lower when you um, use frozen elephant trunks. Um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, outcomes are not necessarily so much better when you look at strokes. Um, but there is no question when you look at frozen elephant trunk surgeries, because you operate higher up in the aortic arch, surgically it's easier to facilitate the distal anastomosis on the aortic arch, and that makes it um, often um, easier to deal with. And obviously, because you have the frozen trunk, um, uh, that is a, um, a more stabilizing factor for the descending aorta than you have the conventional surgical elephant trunk hanging in the, um, uh, in the descending aneurysm. So the frozen elephant trunk for these patients um, is definitely something which um, improves, um, uh, can potentially improve outcome, although um, uh, we do not have proper data on that. The other group of patients, um, which I showed in the first table, um, the patient with hybrid aortic intervention, there was all kind of um, uh, modifications um, in terms of uh, endovascular treatment with, uh, with um, uh, chimney grafts, with, um, with uh, grafts uh, to the um, uh, cerebral vessels uh, coming from the ascending order. There's all kinds of variations you have there, but again, the problem is we do not really know what the difference in outcomes is. However, when you look at the outcome, coming back to this um, paper, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, systematic review, when you look at outcomes, you're most um, uh, interested in the outcome of um, mortality, stroke, and, um, uh, and uh, vertebrate uh, type A dissection. And, uh, and, it, and again, it's very, very difficult to come to any conclusions. But it is important to recognize that when you look at the, oops, sorry, when you look at the highest mortalities here on the left side, um, uh, um, 22% here, 12%, 11%. Um, uh, these three groups had a very high um, uh, number of patients who they treated with uh, hybrid approaches and with, um, uh, with um, uh, more modified kind of um, uh, approaches, which means, on the other hand, purely using a new kind of technology does not necessarily mean that you achieve better outcomes. And the problem with dissections, the problem with any kind of dissection is that it's very difficult to do prospective randomized trials uh, because of the numbers, because of the risk of patients involved, um, and therefore it's difficult to come to conclusions. And definitely for non-A, non-B dissections, we do not have any proper conclusions. However, the goal of surgery in non-A, non-B dissections is the same like in type A or type B dissections. You want that the patient survives, so you need to um, reduce the risk of a mortality and uh, therefore you want to have a normal heart function and you want to have a normal cerebral perfusion. Um, and, and that is not different between the, the three di uh, dissection uh, classification, between the three types of dissections we have. Um, the only difference is that in type B, you do not have much of cardiac um, problems, you do not have much of cerebral complications. That's the reason why you can focus on malperfusion, and that's the reason why you can um, focus a little more on the medical treatment. The more you go to the direction of the aortic root, the more risk you have in the cardiac side, obviously. And of course, when, when you involve the aortic arch, you have the risk of cerebral perfusion. So that's the reason why the principles of surgery, from my point of view, are exactly the same like in the other types of dissection. If you have the heart involved, you need to address the aortic root at the same time. That is usually not the case in non-A, uh, non-B dissections, but I have seen non-A, non-B dissections which have left for four or five days, and then they have a big ascending, um, uh, um, uh, a big ascending, um, ascending hematoma which extends into the aortic root and then suddenly you have a cardiac problem in addition and then you need to treat them the same like you would uh, treat any other um, type A dissection. And most important then is to um, uh, also um, uh, treat the aortic root at the same time. And um, the principle of dissection surgery for non-A, non-B dissection are the same like for um, type A dissections. It is important to keep the interval from the diagnosis to surgery if surgery is needed as short as possible. It's important to have a controlled anesthesia so that the patient do not suffer from hypotension. Uh, it's important that you have 
um, immediate term uh, or early anticoagulant bypass slow if you do operations. It's important to replace the normal aortic root anatomy, stabilize the heart function if the heart is involved. It's important that you have an open anastomosis at the aortic arch to address the aortic arch problem. And if the aortic arch problem is going to the descending aorta, and if you, for example, have a retrograde dissection from, a, um, uh, from an uh, TIVA implanted a few days before, then you need to connect it to the TIVA. So you need to be able to deal with the distal aortic arch but it's important to just follow the same um, the kind of principle we have followed be before. And if you follow certain principles, then you can reduce mortality very nicely. As we have seen before, at King's, we reduced the mortality from 25% in 2004 to 12% a few years ago for the entire group. Um, I think you can achieve very good um, uh, outcomes. The most important thing is that we are aware that there is a higher mortality of patients who have non-A, non-B dissections. The most important thing is that we treat these patients even closer with our colleagues from the vascular um, group and from the interventional group because they will need more individualized kind of uh, strategies to treat, um, to deal with their, um, with their um, issues. Um, one need to look out for potential risk factors of negative outcomes. And I would say if one is in doubt, one should um, uh, uh, go in the direction of surgical endovascular treatment for these patients because we know that um, uh, these patients have a higher risk um, uh, with um, uh, medical treatment from the experience we have seen so far. And um, that is what I would like to close with. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. To have yeah. you all the way from China. Thank you. Eleven hour trip. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Winter. And uh, I just uh, talk with uh, Sanyu about it. because art. Th this is a very interesting, you know, issue or topic because that's the border between cardiac surgeon and the vascular surgeon, and also the border between durability and the mini evasion. So, so. I have two questions. One is, if the patient's the nine on B, we can see the retrospective, uh, the, the retrograde uh, IMH at uh, maybe ascending or the arch. But uh, and, um, we know maybe we have the chance to do the TIVA maybe after one, two, or even three months later. So, so, so in what situation you will wait? Yeah to see whether the retrograde IMH will, yeah, will disappear or uh, in what situation you will do the surgery during the you know, acute stage. So that's the first, first question. Yeah. So if I understand your question right, you, 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 you focus on the fact that sometimes it may be better to wait so that you then can offer less invasive endovascular treatment, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I would, I, I would not disagree. Sometimes it's better to wait to, to, be, to enable yourself to provide another kind of better, less invasive treatment. But to be very, very honest, sometimes it's not good to wait because your patient may die on the time, during the time when he's waiting for the less invasive treatment. Yeah. I mean, we, we all should be under no illusion. 20 years ago, the strategy with uh, a lot of dissection was you wait a little bit longer because the very high risk patient, the patient who has mild perfusion for a long time, the patient who has already coronary ischemia, cerebral problems, they, they, yeah, they select themselves out, improving your outcomes. Well, perhaps with clever imaging, you can predict which yeah. ones can wait yeah, so and which ones cannot wait. And, 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 that, and that may be possible, I agree. But the problem is we do not have much of the data on that because there is not much data. So that's the reason why I would say one needs to come to a pragmatic approach from my point of view. If, for example, I have a retrograde dissection which comes from a TIVA implanted two or three days before, so I know the cause of the, uh, of the retrograde dissection, and I also know that I easily can replace the arch, connect the arch prosthesis to the TIVA prosthesis. That is a very, that, there, there is an element which makes me believe that for those patients it's good to have the operation as soon as possible because nothing will improve because the, the course of the dissection will may, remain the same. If you have someone who had 
no treatment, 80 years of age, has suddenly a ruptured plug in the, um, just in front of the left subclavian artery, and it's a, a concealed hematoma of the aortic arch, I agree. I would be a little more conservative and repeat the imaging maybe 24 hours later, but leave the patient in, under the observation of, um, uh, of uh, the vascular surgeon, cardiac surgeon intervention, and, 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 you, and you take it from there. So I think it's very, very individualized kind of uh, treatment, uh, treatment strategies, and that's the reason why there's no yes or no answer, unfortunately, at the moment. But you've got a second question. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Good. So the, I, you just mentioned that you have a hybrid procedure for the arts, and I mean, the graft the replacement of the ascending and the reconstruction of the three branches, then they put the stand graft downward to, to, to in, yeah, just to, <clears throat> instead of the elephant trunk. So, so, so how to choose the different strategies in your policy? So sometimes maybe totally open surgery, sometimes just hybrid. Yeah, I think, I think when you look into the kind of um, um, publication I showed you to systematic review, what you see is that you have groups with more of a vascular um, base of uh, support and you have groups with more of a cardiac base of support. And what often happens is there is only a certain kind of access in certain institutions to certain kind of therapies. So as a result, in this review, you have groups who only have done hybrid procedures in these cases. You have groups who only have done surgery in these cases. And there are groups who only have done surgery with zero mortality. And there are groups with only um, a hybrid approach, <coughs> hybrid, uh, approach with 20% mortality. There are also groups with hybrid approach with very good um, uh, low mortality. The problem is we do not know. I, the, from my point of view, my personal point of view, we should be very careful too early to move in the direction that we stand across the complete aortic arch. A lot of the endovascular standing of the aortic arch we see is, has been introduced because of very poor outcome of aortic arch surgery. But the point is, sometimes it's easier to train your surgeons up to, an, to a degree that aortic arch replacement has a lower mortality then introducing a very complex, very difficult to provide technology in multiple centers in, in, in a capital or in a country, sometimes very much easier to train your surgeons up to a standard that's easier, makes it easier for them to replace the aortic guard safely. Thank you very much. I you. think we'll have to stop the discussion and continue <laughs> it over coffee. We're running a bit late. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Okay. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Ulrich Rosendahl, who's going to talk about when to use extended arch repair and elephant trunk and when not. Ulrich. It's the million dollar question, yes. Can I have... No, I don't have the slides here. Yeah, when to use a frozen elephant trunk or not is the million dollar question. So we heard uh, from Ola, from Aung, and from Michael that looking at the replacement of uh, the aortic arch has not uh, really changed over the last 10 years. If you look at dissections, it's still the same number. It uh, has not increased, although the pathology, in of case, and I will come into that, would actually uh, recommend that one should uh, do a replacement. And the other big issue is there is no data on whether one should replace the arch with a conventional elephant trunk or a frozen elephant trunk. Each uh, Aortic center uses his own uh, principles of uh, neuroprotection, of cooling down. Every center does it differently. There's no randomized trial whatsoever over 40 years that we are now in arch surgery. So it's a very individualized uh, approach one has in arch surgery. And in my opinion, that has to change in the future. If you look at the first developments, I mean, Hans Borst was the driver in aortic arch surgery. That goes back to 1982. Now we've got 1922, 40 years, and uh, we still do not actually know. So I will come and uh, try to explain during this talk where we, as our centers uh, between Harefield and the Brompton, uh, would suggest that one should uh, go ahead with an arch replacement with a frozen elephant or with a 
conventional elephant trunk. Obviously, if we talk about arch surgery, uh, looking at the development, what we do nowadays, we try to move forward in, in the zones in order to make the operation less complex so that we can have a wider approach over uh, not only aortic centers, that they can be performed by most cardiac surgeons. So we're trying to move uh, the anastomosis into either zone 0 or zone 1 uh, and not try to stay in zone 2 or sometimes even zone 3 because that can be uh, very complex uh, if you're not uh, having the uh, experience and uh, you are not able uh, to perform a proper arch replacement. We've got new uh, devices. Um, the Toraflex uh, Vasodec was the first on the side arms to the neck vessels and side arm for perfusion, which allowed you to do an anastomosis in uh, zone two. Uh, sometimes, if you move it forward to zone one, but it was really not uh, easy to do a zone zero uh, anastomosis. The new Artivion Evita Open Neo comes in three versions: in a trifurcated uh, a version that allows you easily to move forward into zone zero uh, and then in a normal branched and a straightforward uh, version. The indication why one should do an arch replacement is depending on what you expect in the future from the patient. If you look at the repair of and the long-term survival in patients who uh, had an aortic dissection, the type of repair initially performed is actually resulting in the long-term outcome of uh, the patient. If you look at development of uh, uh, descending uh, aorta uh, aneurysms, the reoperations that are needed in the follow-up after dissections are important if you look at mortality. Obviously, the organ injuries that uh, are caused by the dissection is important in the outcome, the mortality and morbidity of the operation, and obviously whether you have uh, or you are somebody who has connective tissue disorders. These are all matters that are very important if you look at dissection repair. Now, dissection repair is obviously not only performed in aortic centers, it's performed uh, over most units uh, that have cardiac surgery, but it's important to understand why and when one should actually uh, think of implanting a frozen elephant trunk or a conventional elephant trunk in the aortic arch and uh, when not. If you look at the type A dissection that is not complicated, like on the right, we would suggest that in most centers you proceed with a classic repair of the ascending aorta, maybe an aortic root replacement. You cool the patient down, but you do not touch the arch as long as the entry tear is not in the arch. This is a very safe operation and good hands has a rather low mortality. Um, and this is all you want in that case in a dissection repair in a center that is not used to use arch replacements. You want to get the patient out of hospital and uh, that's all you want. If there is a complicated dissection leading to malperfusion of organs, that changes uh, the entire setup uh, because if you just replace the ascending aorta and you do not uh, address the organ malperfusion, this patient probably will not survive the operation. There's a good example here. If you look at this uh, CT scan, you see that uh, the true lumen is almost collapsed in the descending aorta just above the diaphragm. It leads to collapse of the celiac artery, uh, and it's actually starting to thrombose because of the malperfusion, and you will end up, obviously, with a result of uh, organ damage, probably of uh, damage of the small and large guts and liver. <coughs> If you look at the results, if you do not repair that in the appropriate way and you've got a malperfused organ system that has one organ malperfused, so maybe a kidney, which happens quite often in uh, just uncomplicated um, dissection, then the mortality is going up to 8.4%. If the numbers of organs increase to three organs, the mortality you will have is over 40% in a patient which is not treated appropriately. If you look at the statistics, it's dismal because half of the patients will not make their way out of hospital because you have not treated it. So what does one need to do if you have malperfusion? You have to extend the true lumen by extending it in the arch and implant a frozen elephant trunk, as seen here in this slide, to actually have an extension of the true lumen that then will be 
perfusing the celiac, renal artery, and the SMA. If you do not do that and you don't extend the true lumen, this patient will probably not uh, make it. The other way of uh, dealing with it, if you are not able to uh, do a frozen elephant trunk or you're not used to it uh, in the regular way, to get the patient uh, over the period of malperfusion is obviously an interventional method and implanting a petticoat uh, in the area which is an uncovered stent to extend the trumen uh, in the meantime so that the patient can actually have organ perfusion. The other issue we have to address is obviously the long-term outcome and the number of reoperations the patient will need in the future and that is depending on where we find the entry points after we did a straightforward ascending aorta replacement. If you look at the changes in locations, new luminal uh, perforations, so entry tears, are mostly in the descending aorta, distal of the left subclavian artery. They're about 12% of all things. If this happens, the patient might end up with an extension of the descending aorta, which then will need another operation, probably either a TVA procedure or even an open arch replacement. In order to prevent this, one has to implant a frozen elephant trunk to make sure that that won't happen, and it is a very safe method. Because if you don't do it, sorry, about 50 to 80 percent of the patients will end up uh, at some stage with another intervention. Now, what we're doing uh, regularly is we either implant a conventional elephant trunk in a setup where we can do an anastomosis in zone two to three, or we debranch and put a frozen elephant trunk in from zone 2 to zone 3 with debranching the left subclavian artery, which in fact is not a great idea because if you look at the perfusion of the cerebellum by the vertebral artery, we had a couple of incidences where the patient ended up with neurological events. So what we do nowadays regularly is we basically debranch the left subclavian artery to the carotid artery directly in order to prevent this. Now, Olaf was talking about the non-A, uh, non-B uh, dissection, whether that actually uh, exists in reality is something we still have to discuss. It obviously, if it is an intramural hematoma, uh, that is an entity that can be covered. In most cases, in our center, we would most probably go ahead with an operation as a prevention for further problems. Looking at the new implantation of the stents, here is the Artivion stent. It's a very straightforward procedure. You basically transect the aorta just proximal of the innominate artery, implant the stent, you cuff, do an anastomosis here, and you can reperfuse via the side arm, which is a straightforward procedure. The problem of this is that the stent is extremely long, it's 175 to 180 millimeter, and if you go with a stent further than zone zero, you will cover a large area of the descending aorta, which then will uh, course other problems which I will show you in a moment. This is the typical operation we nowadays perform. As we said, every institution, every aortic center does it differently. We have developed a method that works for us very well. We have uh, hardly any neurological issues anymore. Bleeding is not a problem because all the anastomoses are in the area where every cardiac surgeon can perform them. It's in the chest. It's not somewhere in the back of uh, the arch. It's uh, pretty simple. We debranch the carotid arteries on both sides with 10 millimeter grafts. We perfuse them through side arms with an extra roller pump, so we have constant brain perfusion during the entire procedure. It's not putting catheters into the arteries, which are sometimes dissected. We basically go via femoral artery access as well, so we've got full distal perfusion, cool the patient down, and our method at the moment is either to 22 or 18 degrees. We are not. Uh, uh, anymore treating anybody at temperatures of 26, 28. We're going down to 22 or 18 degrees. We stop the perfusion and then we basically implant the trifurcated graft, which you see here, directly to the root. If we have to do a root person, we do that as well. We've got the side arm to the perfusion. We've got these two grafts, which we then connect to the graft in an area where if there's any bleeding, it's no problem to actually uh, have that under control. The anastomosis of the graft is here, easy to follow, and we end up with excellent results. 
uh, the AMDS standard won't go into it at the moment. So in retrograde type B dissections as well, we do exactly the same. If they are retrograde, we are implanting a frozen elephant to cover the retrograde dissection over the uh, area which is mostly in the area of the left subclavian artery. In certain cases, obviously, we use D branch stents, but the first approach is a TVAR procedure. The result usually is good. Sometimes there is a distal perfusion problem where we have to do obviously, a crossover. The other, obviously, uh, method which we uh, use in our institution is the petticoat follow uh, with a stent graft in the proximal descending aorta followed by petticoats which opens up everything. But uh, we have different approaches to it if you look at it. Either it's a straightforward TIVA with a debranching here or we use the TIVA procedure uh, after we've done uh, frozen elephant trunk. This is a patient we will have to operate again because we made a mistake. So this patient, everybody was involved. He is full metal jacked. He is a Marfan's patient. And he was initially not operated at our place. Uh, he had a distal stent graft with debranching of the celiac and uh, SMA artery from the ascending aorta uh, and a branch uh, to the innominate artery. We had to reoperate him because uh, his aortic valve fell apart, so we had to take this all off. But uh, at uh, that time of the operation, it was a fourth redo operation. I was actually too lazy to do something. I should have done it differently because all I did, I, it was quite difficult, I left the arch. I should have done an arch replacement at that stage because this gentleman was coming back with a seven centimeter arch. And now we have to operate him again because there's no ways we can actually implant any stem from here because there are too many branches at this side. Now, when do we not implant a uh, frozen elephant junk, and this is the story of neurological injuries. Any patient that uh, is grafted with a frozen elephant junk over TH678 has an exponential increase in paraplegia. Up to TH234, you have a very low paraplegia rate. From then on, it goes up. So whenever we uh, look at CT scans, we exactly look where we implant either a conventional elephant trunk or a frozen. If the frozen elephant trunk goes further than TH6, we do not implant that. We use a conventional elephant trunk and rather have a reoperation later. It's very important to understand that because uh, all the paraplegia we ever had was in patients where we were just too proactive and overstented everything down to TH7, 8, and they really are endangered in paraplegia. A case like this, we would not implant a frozen elephant either. It's a patient where we basically have this huge aneurysm. He's got several ulcerations in the descending aorta, and the most important thing is this angulation. If you implant a frozen elephant trunk that is over 100 millimeter in such an angulation, you might and you often do end up with a kink of the graft. The uh, Artivion um, stent is has more radial force because of the way the stent is built uh, than the Thoraflex. Nevertheless, it can and easily will bend in this area, causing a, a coarctation, which you then uh, will have to deal with. Uh, we had this a couple of times, so we've learned from it. This patient had a straightforward operation with a normal conventional elephant trunk, and he's doing extremely well. We replaced the sending aorta arch and re-implanted everything. The other problem is, and I need to finalize We need this. to get to the conclusion. You yeah. are 10 oh, minutes yeah. over. Sorry. The other issue here is that can cause a problem with a stent. If you basically put a too wide stent into the descending aorta, it can cause these ulcerations. You need to be aware of that. A shorter stent is a better stent than these stents. Just to finalize the uh, talk, so this is what we've done over the years in, in arch replacement since 2012. We've done about 110 in general. The mortality overall with elective urgent emergency operation was 86%. If you look at the elective case, it was 92.59%. It's a matter of uh, dealing with it over years, but uh, the stroke rate is high. One mustn't understand that. This is the result of uh, learning by experience. Our stroke rate now with a new method with debranching has decreased to almost zero. Thank you very much.
Thanks an overview. I'm afraid we have to leave the discussion for later because we are a little bit behind of time. No Thank you much, Roy. And I would like to introduce uh, Michael Gosch, um, uh, who is from uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, where he is a part of the aortic um, uh, team. And he will present to us the concept of multidisciplinary aortovascular uh, surgery in aortic dissection. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I'll probably keep it short because uh, I think there's quite a lot of overlap in terms of what's already, already been discussed. But um, uh, yeah, I thought I'd start with a definition which I've taken from the uh, recent AHA guidelines published in 2022, which I thought was quite a good document. But essentially, um, an aortic team is a specialised hospital team with a high concentration of expertise in the evaluation and management of uh, aortic disease in which care is delivered in a comprehensive multidisciplinary matter. And their recommendations were that all uh, acute aortic uh, pathology should really be uh, uh, discussed with a multidisciplinary team uh, and for patients that require complex interventions, they suggested referral to a, a high volume centre uh, who perform at least 30 to 40 of these procedures uh, per year. And really this volume outcome uh, relationship is something that we've already touched on on a few of the talks, but I thought this uh, work uh, done by the guys uh, from uh, Yale was quite interesting. And, and they uh, looked at um, 54,000 patients who uh, underwent uh, ascending aortic surgery in uh, North America across a thousand different uh, US um, centers. And interestingly, out of those, those thousand plus US centers, only 24 of them performed more than 50 uh, annual cases of uh, ascending aortic surgery. But conversely, more than 600 centers performed less than five ascending aortic operations. And unsurprisingly, there's a clear um, volume outcome relationship in favor of, of uh, centers which perform more surgery. And um, in relation to type A aortic dis dissections, there have been a wealth of publications that corroborate those findings uh, over the last 25 years or so from both the UK and, of course, across uh, the Atlantic. Um, this work from Duke um, was really probably one of the first papers that made, laid emphasis on the uh, importance of a multidisciplinary team and the, and the approach that they have. And, um, uh, you know, they uh, retrospectively analyzed their data from before implementation and after implementation of the multidisciplinary approach and um, things, in this was with respect to aortic dissection surgery. And uh, what they noticed, uh, or what they did, was that they really kind of uh, standardized protocols. They managed patients very closely before surgery on intensive care, sometimes delaying surgery for the next, next day. They spoke with hematology and uh, introduced um, protocols for perioperative bleeding, like things like uh, low-dose factor VII infusions. Um, they uh, standardized perfusion approaches and cerebral, uh, cerebral uh, ischemia protocols. And um, they uh, involved vascular surgery uh, and sometimes uh, treated malperfused segments interventionally before undertaking aortic surgery. And uh, they had a significant improvement in their observed to expected mortality. And these differences persisted over, over follow-up up to five years from, uh, you know, uh, survival rates from 85% compared with 55%. And a 55% survival rate at five years sounds pretty, pretty poor, really. Um, just giving you an idea of the team members, which is probably very similar to, to those uh, in, uh, in the London units, as we've already been described. We have the, the, the obvious members, and uh, increasingly we have aortic nurse um, specialists uh, who do, uh, you know, liaise with PA patients and actively do surveillance clinics. We've got geriatricians that are involved pre- and post-operatively. We have rheumatologists who are interested in, you know, aortitis not to mention you know, all the other anesthesia, perfusion and critical care and allied healthcare professionals. But I think the real um, uh, kind of underpinning uh, important uh, multidisciplinary uh, um, uh, intervention is really the kind of uh, collaboration that we have with the vascular surgeons. And the first ever thoracoabdominal surgery I saw was in 2004 
and um, Peter Taylor and Chris Young were scrubbed together doing the operation and our collaboration at St Thomas's with our vascular colleagues has continued and developed and strengthened over that time and um, it doesn't matter whether it's a hyper acute situation or a chronic uh, scenario or whether we have a formal MDT discussion or we have a corridor conversation we often discuss strategies and techniques and you know they might depending on the individual circumstances suggest we debranch the anomalous or carotid or perform an elephant trunk and we might ask them about you know what they think about re-entry tears in the descending aorta and whether or not they could do a carotid subclavian bypass and as we've already discussed uh, you know we don't have the answers to all of those questions but I think the fact that the, we're having the conversations is is very important and of course the idea behind all of these things is that we're trying to future-proof our patients for any intervention that they might require uh, in the future because we know roughly speaking that for a standard operation uh, an ascending heavy arch in a type A dissection that the 10-year survival is approximately 65 percent and there's a not insignificant rate of reoperation on the root arch and descending aorta and I think uh, we've heard already from several talks that I, I think it's fair to say that our goalposts have moved and where we were previously very much focused on having a very good mortality for uh, you know, uh, the initial operation, we're now thinking more and more about the long-term long impact of uh, what we do and whether or not we change our initial surgical strategy or do things in the early post-operative phase um, uh, involving our colleagues and of course all of these patients will be our patients for life and have active surveillance because what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, preempt uh, any problems and uh, you know if intervention is required in the future it can be done in a more controlled multidisciplinary manner in an, ele in an elective setting which will obviously uh, carry better results than if it's required in emergency. Um, I was very pleased to see this kind of hot off the press. Um, the uh, uh, recent, uh, or uh, you know, approval of um, the innovative uh, elective aortic dissection toolkit, um, and this was is going to help provide a national framework for uh, you know how we can follow up and manage our patients in the longer run. So I think just a quick summary. I mean, we you know we're, we're now really in London in the high volume centres I think we're all very happy with our short term mortality for surgery for type A dissection. I think we're now focused on what we can do to improve the long term survival of our patients and I think it's clear that treatment by specialists in centres of excellence having an individually tailored approach to, to patients and interventions and operations with active, active surveillance and a, a multidisciplinary inputs the way forward. And just in red at the bottom, I think, um, sadly, at St. Thomas's, we don't have an aortic fellow. And I think this is some, somebody or a member of the team that's probably very useful not only to train surgeons in the future, but um, they often are involved with and provide um, important research, which is inevitably what causes a change of practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time. We're going to have to move on. Yeah. So uh, please uh, attack him over coffee with uh, questions and suggestions. But there is nevertheless no interesting. I mean, everyone agrees that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams are key to better outcomes, right? But it's always easy to have a multidisciplinary uh, team around at 1 uh, p.m. at the lunch meeting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to have it around at 2 o'clock in the morning when you are um, uh, facing the dissection, right? So the recommendations. The guideline recommendations say that, but in reality, in the night, it's different. But one needs to establish some kind of ways to integrate it properly, right? I think the ongoing Sorry. problem. Christoph. Good morning, uh, everybody. Christoph is going to talk about the new view on type B aortic dissection in current guidelines. And you sit on all these guideline committees, so you, you know the inside story and the pain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much to the organizing committee to leave me alone with guideline talks. Guideline talks have a reputation to be boring. <laughs> they look back five or ten years in time and they repeat what we know already, usually. But in order to spice it up a little bit and make it more interesting for you, 
I have picked a couple of issues from the recently published American guidelines, and we have Eric Isselbacher here, who was the lead author on it. From the end, and I'm comparing that and discussing this and debating this with some issues of the upcoming European guidelines that see the light of day on the 5th of October in Vienna, uh, next week actually, but I'm authorized to give you a little bit of insight on those uh, issues. This is from the American guidelines, as you can see, the definition of acute aortic syndrome. We are all familiar with that. Aortic dissection, the classic form in tumor hematoma, and uh, obviously some symptomatic ulcerations of the aorta. They come in all, they come in all forms and different uh, uh, stages. Uh, we don't have to spend too much time of it. The good news is that the mortality rate in type, at least in type A aortic, acute aortic syndrome, is lower than 1% as, is, as published in this guidelines, is getting a little bit lower to 0.5 to 0.6% according to the IRAD data recently published in JMA. But that's about it. The, Europe, uh, the, the European guidelines will come up with a little bit more granular anatomic description of acute aortic syndrome, which doesn't really make a big difference in terms of clinical presentation, but the anatomic features are slightly different, and with modern imaging, you can discern them. Back to the American uh, pictures here, they come up again with type A, type B, uh, or type um, the DeBakey classification. We're all familiar with that. The new thing in those guidelines have been discussed this morning, the type, the non-A, non-B, is an entry tear either in the arch or in the descending thoracic aorta with retrograde extension. This is important to realize, not everybody knows this syndrome. And in addition, they use a um, anatomic reporting system from the Vascular Society in the US to report on the involved segments of the aorta from A, B to I with unidentified entry tears in zero zone. The European upcoming guidelines, I talk next week actually, will basically advocate and refer to this uh, so-called TEM classification system with the idea of an analogous, analogy to the uh, TNM system, which we all learned at, at med school, describing tumors and their spread. T for type A, B, or non-A, non-B, we know about this now. E for the entry tail location, and M for evidence of mild perfusion with or without clinical features or symptoms. Important to realize that the entry tear can be described either in the ascending this, um, section or in the arch section or descending section. E1, E0 would be no entry present, basically an extreme form of intramural hematoma. Uh, E1 would be an entry tear in the ascending aorta, E2 in the arch, E3 in the descending. And then moving to the next form, the type B, with an entry tear present in the descending aorta would be E3, and no entry tear found, of course, extreme form of intramural hematoma, E0. And similarly, the same principle applies to the non-A, non-B, with an entry tear either in the arch or in the descending with retrograde extension. That has an impact on treatment, as we heard already. But I want, don't want to bore you too much with these, with these definitions, worse by looking it up. In the American publication from last year, the features of complicated type B dissection, and here we are now to the topic of type B dissection, are rupture, of course, occlusion of side branches, and malperfusion, extension of the dissection in a short period of time, enlargement of the aorta over 40 millimeters, intractable pain, and uncontrollable hypertension. We're all familiar with that. And that's an indication, 1B indication, for treating these patients relatively swiftly with an endovascular approach that may vary from strategy to strategy, but eventually it's a scaffolding of the true lumen and, and closure of the communication tears in the proximal aspect of the descending thoracic aorta with good long-term results that has been shown and replicated by various groups. The American guidelines still relate to the term uncomplicated aortic dissection in the descending thoracic aorta with various high-risk features from expansion over 40 millimeters, false lumen dimension over 20 millimeters, entry tear bigger than 10 millimeters on echo or CT, uh, uh, entry tear in the lesser curvature, increased of the dimension more than five millimeters between serial images, so rapid progression, plural effusion, ongoing evidence of malperfusion on imaging only would be sufficient, and clinical features as mentioned. 
The European guidelines, in contrast to that, took a bold step forward and completely avoid the term uncomplicated dissection. They talk about complicated dissection in the classic sense, we you know that, is an option for emergent TVAR in case of anatomical suitability and absence of anatomical suitability, even a frozen elephant and an open approach comes into play. In case of, not ex uh, of no evidence of malperfusion or impending rupture, the idea is to quote or to, to screen for any, one, any of these complicating factors or high-risk features that had been mentioned in the, in the slide before, they're basically the same. Entry tear greater than 10 millimeters, rapid progression, primary uh, entry tear located uh, in, a, in a way that endovascular procedures are possible. And in that setting, in, 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 in presence of any kind of these so-called risk factors, an active approach with a T-bar within reasonable time of plasticity, or even an open approach with elephant trunk in case of an ascending aorta bigger than um, 4.5 centimeters should be applied or considered with a type 2A, uh, B recommendation. So the, the difference here to the previous guidelines would be to avoid the term uncomplicated in order to, to uh, prime for the search of high-risk features in order to classify the patient properly. So this summarized summarize in this table here, patient with complicated, Type B, get a 1B recommendation, patient with acute complicated uh, but unsuitable anatomy for TIVA, the elephant trunk should be considered, 2AB recommendation rather strong for an elephant trunk, and in type B, dissection with high-risk features, um, the timing would be in the subacute phase with the 2A uh, ev evidence level C recommendation. In patient with acute type B dissection without any of these features that I just listed, Optimal medical therapy, close monitoring, and follow-up with imaging is, of course, recommended. The new thing is that uncomplicated dissection as a term has ghosted for good. It needs to be, uh, we need to spend a few moments on the so-called non-A, non-B aortic dissection. The upcoming uh, guidelines will mention this explicitly uh, based on the location of the entry tear. If the entry tear of this uh, non-A, non-B feature is in the arch. It could be uncomplicated with no high-risk features and then initial medical management and later elective elephant trunk would be the option or if evidence of one of these complicating factors is there, uh, treatment will be initiated of course medically and then emergent fat will be an option. So the point is here to advocate and frozen elephant trunk in case the entry tear is in the arch. If the entry tear is more distally and anatomically suitable for TIVA, TIVA would be a recommendation in these patients after uh, a little a short period of observation, of course. So the summary here would be that in patients with complicated non-A, non-B, uh, the recommendation for active treatment with an elephant trunk would be 2A, evidence level of course is low, C. In patients with anatomical feasibility to cover the primary entry tear with an endovascular approach, again, the recommendation would be 2B evidence level C for TIVA. This has been shown already before. Another important recommendation in the American guidelines published last year would be the, uh, the push for multidisciplinary <coughs> disciplinary, disciplinary teams with a 1C recommendation and of course the recognition that high volume centers do better work and deliver better quality uh, clearly uh, as shown in this previously shown slide uh, with a push for moving those patients to high volume centers where open and endovascular procedures are possible. Just a little glimpse on our um, meetings in February here in, in Windsor in case of the discussion around um, the recommendation to send patients to experience centers with adequate volume. The vote was 19 versus zero in favor of this movement. So that should be re recognized. Uh, in, in absence of evidence, you have to basically take a vote uh, and, and see how many of the participants vote for or against it. There was complete uniform vote pro. Similarly, uh, the decision making uh, 
are based on shared decision making is has been recommended last year and will be recommended this year again with the 1C recommendation that the various players and stakeholders should sit together and discuss uh, the fate of the patient, basically. This is a nice uh, final slide that will be published in the upcoming uh, recommendations with a concept of an aortic organ. This helps you not only to basically understand the need for more surgical approaches in the proximal artery, proximal aorta, and more and more endovascular or medical management the further you go distally with the problem, but it also helps our younger um, or junior medical personnel and doctors and nurses to understand the uh, symptoms associated with aortic dissection based on the affected perfusion territory from a blocked or obstructed or dynamically obstructed side branches. So it's much easier to understand with this concept that a patient can present with a cold foot and some pain in the chest which is indicative of dissection although the typical features are not present. So this concept is easy to memorize and helps to understand and diagnose aortic dissection as well. I won't leave you with this guideline perspective, but I will show you a little bit of a futuristic, oh no, before I do that, I summarize multidisciplinary teams for management of aortic dissection is the way to go. High volume centers with all surgical options will be preferred or recommended. Interpretation of the aorta as an organ is the way to understand this problem and ghosting of uncomplicated aortic dissection is taking place. I said you, I told you that this is guidelines and look back in history in the last couple of years, but there is some future um, elements that are already known, such as a new high-risk feature of progression of less than five millimeters published by a well-known Japanese team that within two weeks and a progression of less than five millimeters is already identifying a high-risk feature of type B dissection which is new and will be probably uh, mentioned in the next upcoming guidelines in five years, and evidence of ongoing inflammation in type B dissection in the subacute phase also identifies patients at risk for later rupture. This is futuristic, but will be part of the upcoming ideas and uh, guidelines in five years from now. Thank you very much. Well, and when will this, the new guidelines be published in October? Well, the, the, pub, the official publication and launch will be next week on next Thursday, week. Yeah, oh, on right. the 5th of October. It right. will, will be published in the appropriate organs. Yes, Sunil. Very good uh, presentation, and thank you for that. Uh, just before the guidelines come out, uh, we had a multidisciplinary uh, sort of um, working, and empirically, or pragmatically uh, with a non-type A, non-A, non non-B, E3, according to your um, flow chart, needs uh, emergent uh, TVAR. If there's complication, there, there was malperfusion. So we, we practiced that recently, and uh, side of his team at St. Thomas's took a patient from us and followed exactly the same pathway even before it's been uh, published. So thank you very much for that. You're always ahead of the game. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one yes. question. Well, uh, so, so the more we go the direction that type B dissections or retrograde dissections, non-A, non-B, however one wants to call them, the more we go the direction that vascular intervention becomes a in more urgent part of the, of the treatment strategies we have, how do we deal with this at um, 2 o'clock in the morning? So do you have the same, like we have now cardiac surgical teams there for specialized uh, um, uh, dissection uh, therapy? Do you have vascular teams doing the same? Well, uh, I've been doing and dealing with type B dissection and even more proximal dissection over the last 25, 30 years. And I've never come across a case of a type B dissection that needed to be treated at 2 o'clock in the morning, to be honest. Uh, these type B dissections... I have a little bit more time than type A dissection and you can sort the patient out properly with probably a, a 24 hour later scan, careful monitoring of the clinical features and clinical signs and symptoms. And then if it's really a, a case of mild perfusion, critical mild perfusion, you can go in the next day or two, three days later. If that's not so urgent, you still have two weeks or three weeks you probably try to move the patient anyway to the window of the subacute case after two weeks in order to avoid 
problems with retrograde dissection? Well, I would say we, we have heard that non-A, non-B dissections, there is a view that some of those should be dealt with from endovascular. Non-A, non-B is more acute than type B dissections. The other thing is there is a lot of type A dissections, at least I have dealt with in the past, where I actually need the additional help by the interventional radiologist or the vascular surgeon at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it's not always so easy to get this implemented. But I believe the more we go in the direction that we see that the team needs to be available, I think yeah. the more we need to have a provision of these services. Absolutely right. Uh, I think the team of surgical and interventional competent people should, should work together, have a rotational responsibility, and patients can be moved within, within hospitals and for appropriate treatment in a hybrid room. Not everybody has the latest hybrid room facility available, but some of us have. And I think we, find a, we have to find a way to distribute the patient to the right place. Two more questions and then we must close. You had a question, sir. Yes. Uh, oh. Just a quick question. Just uh, in reality, many of the type of section we see and we don't treat the patient, if they like to require some treatment, and it's often we miss this three months period where it's important to treat them. When they come a bit late, six months where it's hard to You're right, you're describing the reality. Uh, I think we sh it should change in a way that if a patient is identified on, on presentation, let's say, or on a second scan, we shouldn't lose contact with the patient. We should call him back at least at three months, rescan him. We try to do that within 14 days or after two weeks. But at least we should get every type B dissection that is sent home back within three months and then decide whether there is some evidence of progression, any kind of these high-risk features, and treat him. Because we know that the window of plasticity is three months. We can still treat him. It's often there are not much evidence of progression, but there are high-risk features. Yeah. Yeah, but we, we, we should, the, the policy should change in the sense that we get them all back within a reasonable time and then make a decision. Okay, one last quick question for Rick. Yeah, I just wanted to run a minute to all of them. You're actually right. The problem is, is a major endowment if you put together a hybrid here at the 2 o'clock in the morning, until you have everybody on board, it's 7 o'clock. So, <laughs> I know. Well, I, I know. I know that's the problem, and I will also know the patient who is dead at seven o'clock in the morning without an operation does not appear in any kind of um, uh, analysis later. That is one of the problems. That's what we have to work on. Yeah. Okay. On that somber point, I think we should close. I thank you very much to all the speakers. It's